So where are we? We've been going through Revelation. We're in the last stop. Revelation is made into seven clear events. I'll illustrate them for you. Uh, Number one, it starts with John seeing the church on earth through the eyes of Jesus, and he takes the promises that the scriptures give of being taken out of the world. We find the church in heaven in chapter 4 and 5, but as they go to heaven, whoops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, I should look down. There's the rapture again. I don't mind that. There we get to heaven. Ah, that's the Bema seat, the great judgment of believers' works. While that's going on, the tribulation occurs, which is the biggest piece, the wrath of God in Revelation. Then Jesus comes, and the reason there's flames is, Paul said he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on they, those that know not and obey not the truth. Jesus reigns on earth for 1,000 years. You notice that every event is just one after another. The book of Revelation is really the simplest book if you just read it for what it says. It's just like a movie script. There's the big rebellion, what we saw last hour, the great white throne, and now this is where we are. We're in heaven. What is heaven? Well, as saints, we finally get to start enjoying the initial invitation. God says, I want to dwell with you. Remember, Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. As saints, we finally get to enjoy God's invitation to dwell in his captivating, satisfying, sustaining presence. I don't know what captivates you. Things captivate me. I mean, I love going to Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis headquarters. You know, he has the Ark and he has the Creation Museum. My favorite part is the planetarium. And you lean back, it's better than, you know, Dolby surround sound theaters. You lean back and he does this entire creation presentation and he shows the dimensions of the universe and everything that God says about the universe. And, and it comes to the point with the music and everything, you can just, many of the people probably like me have tears running down their face thinking, God did all that. He's captivating. God is satisfying. He created us. He knows just what we need and want. And, and he, by the way, sustains us. The thing about heaven, if, if you look at this, what's emphasized is, especially when you get to chapter 22, there's the river of life and the tree of life. You see, God wants us to know we are not self-existent. I I can't make it without sleeping and eating and drinking and breathing. God can. He's self-existent. He doesn't need anything. But guess what? When he says, you're with me forever, if you're around God, He gives us everything we need to continue living. And that's what the tree of life and the water of life and all of that is talking about. And we get to enjoy that forever. So let's go on a quick guided tour of heaven. Uh, Just a few truths. God gives us many previews outside of Revelation. Uh, The first preview he gave us is Adam and Eve in the garden. Before sin, what was going on in the garden? Well, heaven is about God himself wanting to meet with us. Remember Genesis 3, 8? The Lord would come every day in the cool of the day and walk around, and Adam and Eve would find him in the garden, and he would walk around with them. See, God, from the beginning, has said, I want to be around you, I want to be with you. It continues two chapters later. Enoch walks with God, and heaven is about getting one-on-one time all to ourselves with God. Bonnie and I once, uh, we were teaching our Sunday school class at Grace Community Church, Uh, Remember, I've told you about that. We had 800 and some senior citizens. One of the senior citizens came up and said, what are you doing this week? And I was 29 years old and, you know, working at Grace Community Church. And I said, I don't know. What do you want to do this week? They said, do you want to go to lunch with me? I said, I'd love to go to lunch with you. They said, well, it'll be complex. Uh, We go to lunch two hours from here. It takes two hours to get there. You'll have to go through security. There'll be another hour of lunch. It takes two hours to come back. I said, that's a whole day. I can't afford a whole day. They said, you'll always regret not coming to lunch with me. I said, hmm, okay. I talked over with Bonnie, and Bonnie says, honey, we don't have a vacation day left. What I didn't know is that person in that class was the Republican presidential front man for the president. They invited me to lunch with, you ever heard of Ronald Reagan? He had a ranch in California. It's called the Rancho de Cielo. They couldn't tell me that because of security. If I told my friends I was going to see the president, someone would follow me and they'd know he was there. And so I missed sitting at lunch in President Reagan's mansion in Santa Barbara. 
because I didn't have enough time. That's sad. Heaven is something you don't miss. You get one-on-one -on -one time all to yourselves, not with Ronald Reagan, who, by the way, uh, many people claim he really was a devout follower of Christ. Uh, it's very interesting. Joel Rosenberg, if you ever read his book, cites all of the, you know, Ronald Reagan's love for the Lord. But you know what's better than Ronald Reagan, this president from the past? God. And Enoch shows us that God wants us to spend time one-on-one -on -one with him. Well, how about David? David said that I'm going through life and at the end, in the 23rd Psalm, I get to go and dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The one that guided me all the way through life, heaven is having God as my personal provider forever. He guides me and takes me home and even walks me through the valley of the shadow of death. How about Jesus' name? This is a little preview of heaven. Jesus will be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Jesus makes God with us possible, and he's the one that opens the door. Now back to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, remember, to understand the book of Revelation, you always have to look at the context. Who were the original recipients? A lot of poor, oppressed, persecuted, enslaved people. Christianity works well with the poor and with the outcasts and with the oppressed. Why? Because they realize his promises. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I know everything about you. I am with you always. And not only that, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when it's ready, I'll come and pick you up. Have you ever met someone going on a cruise or going to a concert or, you know, going on something special and they get so excited about it, that's all they talk about, and then they take pictures of it, and then they, that's all they do is post it. That's what going to heaven is like. Only we're not that excited about it. And maybe that's something we should think about. Well, excited the early church. See those seven? Cities, that's who this letter was written to. John was a prisoner of the emperor on Patmos off the coast there. This book was written and sent by ship to Ephesus. It was copied and sent to Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis, you know, all the way around Laodicea and Philadelphia and all the way around the churches of Turkey. And it presents that heaven is so vital we should think about it.